everyone. Welcome to Innovation Root Studio. I'm your host, Nupur, and today I'm really, really excited to have Mr. Michael Spade and Michael Hubbin with us in the studio for an interesting discussion. Michael Spade is the Agile Transformation Pioneer, and Michael Hubbin is the founder of Michael Hubbin Consulting. Yeah, and uh, Michael, uh, I would like to begin with asking, what is most important at the beginning of transformation? I, I think just to say very briefly is to go in with the expectation that you don't know anything. Yeah. And from a little more from conventional point of view, I would say uh, to really understand why you're doing it in a detailed way. Because mm -hmm. um, people people at this point are doing agile transformations because everybody else is, or because they're supposed to, or their CEO said that it was a good idea, or their peers are pushing them in some way. And that's not a good enough reason to go to a remote transformation. It has to have a deeply personal reason and a deeply convincing organization reason for doing it. Uncovering that business driver and, and a vision Maybe the most important thing at the beginning because it just shapes the everything that goes on. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, I uh, you said something about personal, and um, I find things begin better when people are connected personally to what it is that they're doing, that they actually have some personal stake at it. Otherwise, the whole thing becomes an abstraction, and um, I think that's one of the things that I'm sort of listening for is to what degree is this personal uh, for people and, and and the other thing all at the same time as this is that I'm paying attention to what is the nature of my entry into this system and um, uh, am I like barging in am I coming in like expected to know the answer are they hoping for something for me what's the nature of my entry and so I find that the the more silently I can enter into a system, and, be, and almost even invisibly, to be able to catch the system where it's at right now. Because what I have found is that oftentimes, um, when people are asking me for my help, they're already wanting to prove to me that they're okay. And um, so it's a it's a it's a strange moment that uh, that I find um, that the more reserved I am, the more silent, the more I step back and observe and pay attention and just put in just little bits here and there, um, kind of catch the system a little off guard a little bit and also warm up that I'm not going to invade uh, their territory. Is that safe silence helps us listen better or hear clearer? I would say uh, silence helps us hear more deeply. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so mm -hmm. I, I would, yeah, I think I would agree with somebody who would want to listen to you deeply. And, mm -hmm. and um, there's always lots of voices going on in our organizations, in mm -hmm. our gossip, in yeah. our chatter, and there's all these voices going on in our heads. So it's kind of busy and uh, still. Quiet voices are the ones that are the most important. The ones that are most important to hear, they're where insight comes from, or where, where the heart connection comes from. Yeah. And, and the deepest thing that we can perceive or, or know. And I think another aspect of this, just to make the emphasis a bit, is that um, I'm, I'm wanting people to um, feel like it's really okay. And that there's, there's, there's nothing that they necessarily have to do. Like to start with that as a foundation in the relationship, um, it, 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 creates, uh, um, it creates an air of uh, authenticity and, and it makes possible an approach that's authentic because it's just, it, otherwise it just becomes like a kabuki play. You know, it's just like 
everyone is, is in their staged positions. And um, um, the beginning uh, is, is always almost the most key part of something like this, like the beginning of a symphony. Yeah, the other thing about the beginning um, as a as a external coach or, mm -hmm. or consultant is that uh, it's always there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The whole yeah. dilemma yeah. that you're going to face in the client yeah. shows up maybe on the first day, but like really soon. <laughs> and and, and yeah. the difficult positions they're going to yeah. put you in. So if they have, yeah. if the if the CIO has a hard time finding the time to meet with people, yeah. that's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. if, the, if, the, if the leadership team is not willing to really look at themselves and they're part of it, they're not willing to do a leadership uh, mm -hmm. 360 to get actual feedback on their leadership, it's a bad sign. That means they're not going to play full out in some way. They're going to try to get somebody else to change mm -hmm. instead of them to change. Uh, if, uh, if there's conflict between this stakeholder and that stakeholder uh, early on, you know that's going to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's never we, we tend to ignore those things. Mm -hmm. we, we our voice yeah. wants to have it yeah. successful. We want to be yeah. engaged. We want to find a path that's going yeah. to work through it. But that's uh, to our own detriment. Yeah. So it's better to take in what's really true and just see it for what it is. Right. How, how can we get to this? I, I, I actually um, am happy when emotions show up at the beginning. If this is if this is the nature of your question, um, and it could be even emotions of boredom, you know, emotions of of anxiety. Um, I, I'm I'm happy to see them show up without necessarily forcing anything. Uh, is that does this feel like that's getting to the nature of the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would, for me, I would say um, it's not important for fear not to show up. It's important for fear not to yeah. run you, not to mm -hmm. run the show. Mm -hmm. um, uh, fear is always going to come up with everybody, yeah. including me as a coach. Yeah. Um, uh, but if I, if, I, if I run my life or my strategy by that, that's going to be a problem. If I um, merely note it along the way or incorporate it in, it's going to give me some kind of understanding that it's delicate. Okay. Uh, it yeah. has to be gentle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I hear the word I, I hear the word gentle, and um, there's something about or that. Rough. Well, but yeah, but I'm actually responding to gentle. I mean, it could be rough. Uh, uh, like sometimes we've been talking about entering in rather silently. Uh, and at some point, we might need to rough things up a bit to see what it is. Because sometimes there's a, this is part of that kabuki dance. It can also be a dance of politeness. And... Um, <clears throat> so I think really being, uh, and Michael, you're, po you're pointing to this, that being aware of our own anxiety, our own fear, our own boredom, because oftentimes it's boring. I mean, quite frankly, you know, listening to these people's stories and all this, it can, it can be quite boring. And to be willing to interrupt uh, and to be willing to provoke uh, in order to, um, if for no other reason, and there are other Plenty of other reasons, I, I think, if for no other reason than to signal that this is not business as usual, and especially with external consultants, they want it to be business as usual. They're desperate for that, for it to be business as usual. 
they want to be able to come out on the other side of this being okay. And, you know, honestly, if I, I don't want it to be okay on the other side of this. I want it to have moved someplace. So there's a combination of gentleness and even love and, and certainly deep respect and a willingness to um, maybe not be rough, it, it certainly well, provoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the business as usual comment, um, you know, that's, as we've been talking this week, that's just the predictive plan yeah. that thinking is still trying to keep them safe. And, and, and you know, that would be okay, we could understand that, but it, mm -hmm. won't, it won't help you transform. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you actually want to transform, that won't give you that. Mm -hmm. So, so that's always that. There's always a tension of yeah. clients say they want to do a certain thing, like let's say go have a transformation happen, but <laughs> then they're ambivalent about actually paying the price for that, yeah. not in terms of dollars often, but in terms of commitment and sacrifice and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes much more than that. I think and when I've gone through transformation processes, I have to be dragged kicking mm -hmm. and screaming in a certain mm -hmm. way. When, oh, in your own transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. want to get yeah. those things. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and life conspires to push me. Yeah. And, and that's the role that an external consultant can serve yeah. is um, not for their own Manipulative benefits of something, but to but to explore and find out, you know, what's really going on in the organizational system, and to help reflect yeah. that back. That, yeah, that's you being safe here. Yeah. You need to actually take some new risks. Yeah. You have to think about things in a very different way. You know, uh, my one of my teachers, Peter Block, used to talk about how one of the main reasons managers and companies hire consultants is to prove to everyone else that they were right all along. That the consultant will fail so that the manager can say, see, I was right. It is really helpless. And so in some ways, the, you have to break the mold of, of what it is, what the strategy that people are operating in in which I become, you know, like their opera, and I become a spirit carrier in their opera. In other words, I become a part, I play a part in the thing that they're staging. And very smart managers can do this quite well. And so it's, it's, a, it's tricky, uh, I think, to be able to kind of navigate all of these uh, uh, dynamics that are going on. And, and I think to come back to what we started said at the beginning, to come from a place of silence, to come from a place of inner stillness, to be able to pay attention to, um, to be at attentive for whatever might show up that could be surprising. Yes, so um, now we understand the importance of the beginning of the transformation, mm -hmm. what is important in the beginning. How, how can we make sure that we do not deviate from the organizational purpose when undergoing transformation? Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I think we have to, um, it depends on at what level the purpose mm -hmm. is defined, because mm -hmm. on a certain level, the purpose is a, is a hypothesis yeah. rather than a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So we sort of have to keep testing that it's the right purpose. Um, it has to keep feeling like we're on track, like it's the right compass for us to be going towards, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's one kind of framing I would put on it, and and another is that um, you know, assuming we have the the right most current purpose, we have to, um, I think, get get some group of stakeholders in, in a governance sense together periodically to look at it from different perspectives mm -hmm. to, you know, because it's easy for it to, when it goes into one person who's the, the transformation leader, um, they can get sidetracked or distracted mm -hmm. by things that seem important or seem like the thing that they need to pay attention to, but that are not actually. 
but they lose the overall, I mean, they need guidance from the whole system, not from um, just one person. You need one person to lead it, mm. but you also need multiple people to guide it. Yeah, I, I often find that, um, especially when I go newly into an organization, that any purpose is good enough initially. Because mm. it's... Um, Chances are, if it's a purpose that's been a guiding star, or star for this organization for some time, um, my bet is is that there's not a lot of alignment around it, and maybe not even not, not much even shared understanding around what it means. Because usually, organizational purposes are very uh, they're really abstract for people. And so when I go into a new organization, it's like any purpose will do. For instance, I worked with this one organization and I asked them, so, you know, why are you, why, what is it that you're up to, for instance, in this big transformation? And he said, I, I just, you know, we're an isolated office. This is a huge national company and we're in this isolated geographical location and I just want to get ourselves on the map. Now, on the one hand, you could say that's a really, you know, inauthentic and perhaps even stupid purpose or you know um, or vision or mission um, but it didn't matter because it's, it's like a place to start and then a year into this is like you know um, a longer term transformation a year into it, it's like okay now we've done some work now we've uncovered some stuff now we've run into all kinds of challenges now let's have that let's have a conversation for that question again what's your purpose and it's a completely different conversation at that point. Yeah, and you, you make me think of um, what I might describe as the evolution from um, a goal to a purpose. Uh-huh, yeah. So yeah. people, um, yeah. you know, a goal is to make, you know, 50 million in sales next mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. That's not a purpose. Mm -hmm, uh, but, mm -hmm. so, but, but sometimes people would talk about that as a purpose, but to me that's not a purpose. It doesn't have the compelling quality that a purpose does and and sometimes a goal will evolve into a purpose mm -hmm. and it will be better or, or it will clarify into and you, you need both but um uh, purpose is a higher order driver than a goal is mm. and and um and you're helping me to see more clearly that um i find that when people discover purpose in the midst of a process in, by which they've crossed some transform, trans, transformational edge. We use an edge as a, as a way to describe having moved into territory that's a little uncomfortable, right? Because it's new territory. As people move into, more ter uh, uh, into new territory, um, a different relationship to the nature of where we're going emerges. And, um, and I think, and I find that that can be really uh, uh, powerful moment to have that kind of conversation for purpose or for vision or mission. So purpose also evolved with the transformation process? Um, well, yeah. So you brought up the word sense making at some point. Yeah. That earlier. Was, yeah. That was earlier when you were talking yeah. So it Purpose is an ongoing conversation. You know, we have a conversation for purpose, not we arrive at a purpose. At least that's how I tend to view it. Uh, that it's a that it's a context for a particular kind of sense making or shared sense making in which we engage, and it helps us kind of like helps us get our head around what is it that we want to be paying attention to in a certain way. Please share your views on evolving consciousness in us as leaders and managers. Well, a, a summary comment to get us started mm -hmm. is that um, mm -hmm. uh, upgrading our leadership, making it more agile, making it more integral, mm -hmm. is about uh, shifting consciousness, is about evolving consciousness. So it's not like it's some uh, per se spiritual pursuit or, mm, yeah, uh, yeah, or yeah, something yeah. else. It's about yeah. effective leadership. 
uh, the more we evolve our own consciousness, the better leader yeah. we'll be. That's period. End of end of discussion. Yeah. So, so for me, that's the uh, in in uh, my book, uh, Asm Transformation. It's one of what what we call the integral disciplines because it's so key to um, moving toward organizational agility. You've got to evolve consciousness, and so you as a change leader have to evolve your own consciousness. Yeah, I, I I was on a panel earlier today, and and uh, and the others were bus- they were all business leaders. And um, what really struck me is and they were talking about very very high levels of technical expertise or technical capability. And um, the thing that kept striking, or this, the the question that kept coming to my mind is is that what's the nature of consciousness required to be able to hold that sort of com- the complexity of thinking required to marry technical com- complexity with business complexity and have it kind of integrate in a way that it solves genuine business solutions. So, it's, so to me, um, spiritual uh, dimension aside, it's really about how do we how do we create conditions in which effective organizations in a VUCA world become possible. And it's organizations don't exist without individuals and relationships. And um, I often say that relationships are the the, the kind of irreducible atomic uh, particles of organizations. And and relationships are always entered into by people who have either greater or lesser effectiveness in their ability to relate and communicate with others. And it, 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 it starts with our own level of consciousness, which is another way of saying our own complexity of sense making. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, being um, uh, my co author and I uh, had an interview with Ken Wilber, who's um, in the, uh, we're finishing up our book. And uh, he said that transformation has two most important uh, in qualities or principles. One is the ability to take the perspective mm-hmm. of other, mm-hmm. and the second is the ability to see our own seer. Mm-hmm. So to mm-hmm. see how we make sense of the world, essentially, but mm-hmm. to see how our mind works, if you will, mm-hmm. to see um, uh, where we're trapped, where we make assumptions, or um, where we have beliefs that limit us, that make us mm-hmm. think that we're only valuable if we um, know everything. We're only mm-hmm. valuable if we get the most done or win. We're only valuable if we're liked by other people. Those are categories of limiting beliefs that we mm-hmm. have. So we have to see that process mm-hmm. in ourselves. We have to actually be able to observe it, to shift it, to upgrade it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, that ability to observe ourselves seems to me to be key. And um, I mean, think about how much organizational dysfunction is driven by the concerns that, that you just now said, Michael. I mean, you know, it's, it, uh, it's remarkable to see what can happen when people develop just the capacity to be aware of their own beliefs and assumptions and mm. theories and triggers, just just that alone, they don't have to necessarily develop much of anything else. But just that alone, um, the power to transform organizational environments is um, uh, it, it's remarkable to see. individual, I can uh, measure or understand that I am a leader, that I that I contribute to people's life. How do I get to know that? I yeah. I, um, it's 
So there's lots of ways into that. So I'm going to yeah. just, I'm just going to open one door, just almost <laughs> randomly, right? <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, we'll see how it goes. But, but well, well, uh, I'm curious to see what door. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I'm not quite sure it's going to come in my mouth either. So um, I, I would say that one place that um, to look is um, uh, the degree to which I'm willing to take responsibility for the world around me. Well, I don't know if it makes me a leader. I said it's just one door, right? Or just this is a doorway into it because it's a well, complex question. But, but, but yeah, that would be, but, but the place where you're willing to take responsibility is yeah. the place where you would naturally lead, right? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's where yeah. you at least have the disposition to be a leader. Right, right. And then you have to see whether, um, you know, uh, in, in a leadership program I was in, um, the kind of bottom line definition of being a leader was um, leaders take people somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and um, mm -hmm. am I taking people somewhere? Mm -hmm. Not not through commanding them mm -hmm. or directing them necessarily, but um, but through showing them, through persuading them, through inspiring them, through um, uh, hearing them and responding. Maybe mm -hmm. am I able to? Am I interested in taking people somewhere within that area that I'm taking responsibility for? Mm -hmm. The word that comes to mind when you say that, Michael, is the, the word enrollment. Yeah. And usually we think of enrollment like I enroll into a college class. Um, but I mean enrollment in a very different way. Uh, the way that I mean enrollment is um, helping another person see a, possi a new possibility for themselves such that they're willing to act on that possibility. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's strikes me as another aspect of leadership, which is, um, and, and it's courageous. To, to the, it requires taking a certain stand uh, in regard to our relationship to other people that, and it's a stand that stands for the possibility of being able to impact other people or to enroll other people. And um, it's not, it's not, it doesn't come from an arrogance. Can you see that? It comes from, it's actually kind of an egoless taking a responsibility for uh, the possibility of our impact in the world, and it takes a certain degree of courage, especially for it to go about doing that with with humility and and mm -hmm. and uh, recognition of our own uh, limitations. Yeah. I really thank you, Michael and Michael, for, <laughs> for sharing great yeah. insights on important yeah. aspects of transformation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right from the beginning to mm -hmm. the process yeah. of transformation, and how evolving consciousness uh, is important yeah. as, a, as a leader and as a manager yeah. in today's world, especially, mm -hmm. and also what makes an individual a leader. So, thank yeah. you, thank you so yeah. much for sharing your You're insights welcome. with us. And thank you so much for being with us in your studio. It was yeah. a pleasure discussing yeah. with you. Yeah. And we look forward to learn more from you.